and salutations to one and all. How you doing? Welcome to the night shift with DJ Kevin Stew Community and Finance Night. So glad to have you all locked in. Say big ups to each and everyone locked in. Those on tune in radio on the night shift to DJ Kevin Stew. Big ups to you. Big ups to the affiliates near and far. Those on One Harmony Radio over there in the UK. Top of the morning to you guys in the UK. Big ups to my friends over there in New Jersey. NIE Radio. Big up the motivator. Remember you can catch the motivator. Thursdays for Double Triple Thursday Saturdays for Motivation Saturdays I want to say thank you to those who are locked in from New York Island Worldwide Exhibiting the power of music Big ups Gary Much love China Nicole Blessings to those who are locked in on the Foundation Reader Network, ClintonLindsay.com. Mr. Lindsay celebrating 45 years in the industry. Well representing South Florida. And New York. Big ups, Mr. Lindsay. I want to say big ups to those who are locked in on PEMGTV.com Everybody already know it's my name 
Much love to the family out of Texas. Uh, strong contingent out of Texas. All the Radio do stick media group. And the WGLRO, home of the Dunning Walker Morning Show. The People Station, taking it from the sheets to the streets. Stretching everywhere from Detroit to Denmark and all points in between. Big up Danny, how you doing? Those who are locked in on Facebook Live, welcome to you. Those on Clubhouse, big ups to you for you. If you're looking for the night shift with DJ Kevin Stu on Clubhouse, the club is called the Stew Pot. It's a nice room. It's called Therapeutic Jurisprudence. Jurisprudence with Judge Ginger. All right, therapeutic jurisprudence. Look for the room, share it with people. I know Judge Ginger like that so, likes that one. Catch me on the road, find the love. See my jamming down to the floor. Everybody already know it's my day. It's called My Behavior, the track that's playing in the background. The artist goes by the name Rain. Inviting you all to call a friend, tell a friend, friends of your friends, friends of your enemies, and your enemies too. We're not leaving anybody out. So we got your friends, your friends of your friends, friends of your enemies, and your enemies. We're not leaving anybody out, right? Cool. We have everybody covered. Yeah man, you leaving your behavior at home? I'm not leaving mine at home. I take mine everywhere with me. I do want to say thank you to my segment sponsors. Pulse Media Group and being in a moment is priceless. Give them a call. You have an event you want to stream live? A church service, a funeral, a seminar, a party, a graduation, you name it. If you have a secure platform you want to stream on or you want to stream on theirs, call them up 754-999-1140. Tell them you heard about them on a night shift to DJ Kevin Steele. I want to say thank you to Althea and her healing heavenly hands. Althea SU is a licensed massage therapist operating out of Broad County, North Miami Dade, and Palm Beach counties. She comes to you bringing her oils, her table, and over 20 years massage therapy experience. Give her a call 954 655 9000. Or you can email her at Thea Later, that's T H E A L A T E R, Thea Later at att.net she only has one request outside of paying her you get off her table and go sleep somewhere else when she's done that's because i always fall want to say thank you to reggae global entertainment reggae global entertainment will act as your booking agents handle your tour management take care of your business registration legal service referrals music production marketing and promotion and so much more Check them out at reggaeglobal.com and see what they can do for you. And thank you to McNeil Trucking. With McNeil Trucking, you're in good hands. They are licensed and insured movers. So if you want to move from here to there, if you want to know how to do it, go ahead and give them a call. 954-406-9740. That's 954-406-9740. Thank you, McNeil Trucking. And speaking of numbers and calling, we do invite you to call in tonight. You have questions. You just want to say hi. You want to say thanks. 773-789-STU is a number to get you in touch. That's 773-789-7839. I'll say it once more. 
0549-800-2539. You can call, you can text, you can WhatsApp, you can Telegram. Right now, my bum bum. It's All of those work. Right now. You see it scrolling across the bottom of your screen there? Uh, yeah. And of course, I invite you all to jump into the stew pot on kevinstew.com if you're wondering what the stew pot is it's what others call a chat room but because we're fancy over here on kevinstew.com we call it the stew pot it's where we keep things interactive and bubbling all you have to do is use the link that is pinned in the comment section on facebook or you see it in the description on on, on clubhouse yeah man just come on over you don't need to register, you don't need to offer a firstborn, blood sacrifice, internal organ, nothing like that. Let's go to kevinstew.com and you're there. Alright, so without further ado, let me bring on the person who is taking over the remainder of the broadcast. She doesn't know it yet, you know, but she should have learned from the last time. This is her broadcast. I'm just facilitating it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the very first of her kind in the United States. There she is. What a smile. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Ginger Lerner Wren. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Hi, Judge. I am well. How are you? I'm great. I am, I am so incredibly psyched to be here with you tonight. Let's I've been really looking forward to coming back and continuing our fabulous conversations. Oh yes, I've been so waiting for this day and looking forward <laughs> to it. And here it is yet again. I'm just loving it. And here it. it is yet again. Welcome to yeah. my courtroom. Yes, it, 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 I'm honored. Finally, I get to be in yeah. your courtroom. <laughs> Finally, right. I don't know if you can see that, but um, this is my bench. Let me move over. There you go. Yeah, there you yeah. go. My robe and everything. I'm loving it. Real deal. I'm loving it. Is that post-it notes you have behind you over there? Yeah, those are post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what they say, but... Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> I love it, though. Um, <laughs> a nice a nice touch. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Um, I, I, I decided to, to name tonight's broadcast Therapeutic Jurisprudence. Well, I, that is fabulous because, you know, I've got so many leaders around the country that, uh, you know, are, are dedicated to what we call in the field TJ. Right. So you have to wait a second because I, I want to take a picture of this. Wait one second so oh. I could send it to them. Yes. Because this is going to make them so happy. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, this is exciting. This is a very empowering, empowering part of the law. And uh, I, I'm so I'm so pleased that you did that tonight. I, you, you know, I don't know. It must be something in the air because this is what we're really focusing on um, yes. of late uh, and needed now more than ever, more than ever. True, true, very true. Um, I, I, I got it from our first broadcast, which if those who missed it, you can go back in the video archives on the Night Shift with DJ Kevin Stewart on YouTube. Or just go to kevinstew.com and over on the left hand side, you'll see the video archive. You can just scroll through and go back to December 2019. December the oh. 2nd, 2019 to be exact. And in that, we're introduced to the topic that I have named this broadcast after. Because that was the first time we talked publicly. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I, you know, and I think it's just, uh, 
it, it, it's such a, a novel concept in the law that a lot of people, even lawyers, you know, don't really understand it, don't really know about it. And mm. yet it's it's the it's the it's the fuel, it's the battery pack, it's the it's the energy that, you know, really drives, um, you know, that drove the first uh, drug court in the United States and all problem solving courts and gives gives uh, the law really open field, you know, to really promote uh, healing and uh, recovery yes. and wellness and taking, a, you know, a, an alternative approach uh to criminal law and juvenile law and, and it, it, it's it, and all and, and solving and creatively solving so many problems yes and um we learned from that broadcast that primarily that is what mental health court is um for those who and and to, to this day i'm talking with people that don't know that in the United States exists a mental health court? Actually, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. <laughs> right. You know, I, I don't know In how the much United there, States there are, and no. around the world now. My yes. gosh, I'm a, I'm a locator on SAMHSA. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. And um, I, I, two weeks ago, um, I had just finished playing soccer and I was talking to some some colleagues some friends of mine and I, I mentioned the fact that hey listen you know coming up in a couple of weeks i'm gonna have george wren on my broadcast and they're like okay who's that and it's like you don't know who that is that's america's very first mental health court judge and they're like america's what i'm like yeah, y'all need to get with the times because these are things that are happening around us, you know, and these are, th these are, uh, I guess, parts of the judiciary that are needed, because, especially now, you know, especially two years ago, especially we're saying now, that, boy, more, more than ever, uh, we, and we have these beautiful dialogues in the courtroom because based on you know, TJ, you know, we really promote storytelling. We mm -hmm. want to hear the voices of the people that are in front of us. Yes. Um, so, you know, we, you know, there's so much, uh, you know, negativity and toxicity around, you know, the country and our, you know, and we really need to prom promote kindness and compassion and, and caring about one another. So this Indeed. is just really important, you know, subject. Now, you, you, you talk about um, one of the things we didn't touch on, I should say, back when we first spoke. I want to just quickly touch on that as we get started. And that was your book. You authored a My book. book. And I, 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 I even love it. And you have a copy right there. <laughs> I do. I don't know if I can get it in the frame really well, but um, no worries. I'll it put it up. There around. we go. But this is there. It is there. It is a court of refuge. Uh, stories from the bench of America's first mental health court. And this is published by Beacon Press. It's all human stories. Really, you know, composite stories. And very much, you know, every chapter reads like a play, a very dramatic, you know, profoundly um, humanistic and dramatic stories of what families go through, what people go through when, you know, they have a mental health condition and, you know, really can't get access to care or there's barriers to care or there's cultural barriers to care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, one thing leads to another, and then all of a sudden they find themselves incarcerated. Right. That's. And uh, you know we you know there's a name for that, Kevin, and uh, that's called uh, the criminalization of people with serious mental illnesses. So, 
Yes. You know, as we, yeah, and I mean, as we speak, there's an estimated 386,000 people behind bars mm. in America with mental, you know, with mental illness, largely because people cannot get access to care. So you said 386,000? Correct. And this is the most recent number. Yeah, this is recent data, it's, you know, and uh, some of the data is a little bit higher, but, yeah, you know, when, when, when we look at U.S. jails and when we look at U.S. prisons, uh, an estimated, you know, in U.S. jails, one in three uh, persons have some kind of mental health condition, um, you know, seri serious mental health condition and, uh, end up homeless or, you know, um, behaving in, in, in ways that, that land them in jail. And yes. um, jails are serving as our largest de facto psychiatric hospitals, and that's not a new phenomenon. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of crazy, though. And we talked about it the first time that you visited, you know, the criminalization of individuals you know especially those in need of mental help and i'm thinking that no it has improved a little bit as people become more aware as organizations um, speak up more and even the law enforcement agencies become more sensitized and specialized in, in dealing with, with some of these situations, but with 300, over 380,000 individuals still incarcerated due, due to some type of mental illness, you know, that's still a high number. I remember you saying there were about 23,000 that were kept out of the prison system as, as we knew it um, as a result of wor working through the mental health court system. Well, and we've been really, you know, we've been very fortunate, to, uh, you know, our community here and I, just for your listeners, because I, 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 you know, I know that you're airing globally, yes. um, you know, that that where I'm coming to you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, mm -hmm. and um, that's where the court is based. Yes. And of course, the court is starting its 26th year in June. And I'm a criminal, I'm a criminal judge. I mm -hmm. hear county court misdemeanor cases, everything up to a year in jail. And, you know, believe it or not, I mean, the mental health court is a part time court. I have a regular criminal division as well. Right. But the but the mental but the mental health court, I think I, I just want to you know, say that we've diverted, you know, over 23,000 people out of our jail. And we really do it with an all credit to our community providers and stakeholders and advocates and social justice advocates and, yes, yes. you know, uh, stakeholders and providers that are literally ch were willing to change and realign their service models so that they could share their their limited finite resources, you know, with this court so we could take individuals out of an inappropriate system of care, that being a jail, mm -hmm. and move them or divert them, the jargon is diversion, diversion, um, you know, into um, appropriate, you know, services and housing, or if they need a hospital, you know, we'll work with them until they're ready for discharge into, into home, into placements and housing, or just going home, but yeah. linking them with services and really using the authority of the court, using the power of, 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 of the authority of the judgeship to, to really hold hold systems accountable to the people that we serve. There's always this, this confusion. Oh, you're holding people accountable 
you know, to their treatment. Well, that's sort of, you know, that's sort of, I guess, the case. But the truth of the matter is this is really about holding providers accountable to the people that they serve because resources and treatment, you know, is so scarce Yes. Um, that um, it's really hard for anybody to get really what they need. So I think in terms of recovery and wellness for everybody listening, the, the message that I want to start with, you know, fundamentally is that, you know, mental health is is essential to overall health. It's essential to all health. We can't mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. anything, Kevin. You can't be here tonight with me and I can't be here tonight with you, right? Having this conversation if we are not emotionally and, and, and psychologically well. True, and true. So, and treatment works and it's not unlike any other, you know, physical illness and all of that stigma and all of, you know, misinformation surrounding mental health, you know, we're so aware of it, but it's our job, Kevin, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to dispel um, those myths and uh, that stigma and to really talk truth. And the truth is that treatment works. People get better. They go back to school, college, work. They have relationships. They get married. And I don't think that there's one walk of life mm -hmm. that I have not seen come through the court in terms of professionals and doctors and nurses and accountants and artists and you name it, we've seen them in mental health court because no one is immune from, from a right. mental health condition. Right. And, you know, we, we mentioned the last time we spoke about, we talked about um, communities having it taboo to talk about mental health. I grew up in one such community. In, in Jamaica, when I was growing up, you know, you saw someone on the street as a vagrant, not knowing their story. And we just call them mad people. Whether they be mad men or mad women, we just, that's, that's all we knew them as, as. That's what I knew them as growing up. And it was only as an adult that I came to learn some of these individuals are, are there not because they have lost their faculties, but because of other situations, right? They end up homeless. Sure. And to, sure. to, to, to just to so let's have peace of mind. They let's act talk about that for yes. one minute because you struck a chord, Kevin, that we need to talk about. You know, the research tells us and the court is always guided by research, right? That's the yes. research on new innovations, research on what works, and research that people need to hear. So we're really turning the courtroom into a classroom. Right. Because everybody needs to be educated. So I don't want people to miss any, you know, a, you know an opportunity to really become educated about mental health conditions. And so the research tells us that when people, first of all, 75% of individuals get diagnosed with a mental illness in their teens, in their mm. teens, and, and, and many afterwards as we get older, but the research tells us it could take up to a decade for parents to and families to really identify and understand what they are seeing in terms of the behavior of a loved one. Mm. They don't know what men people don't know what mental illness even looks like. What you know, how do you know if, if your if your son or your daughter or your brother or your sister or your spouse, whatever, is having emotional issues. So right. um, that's that's a big you know that's right there a very important piece of information and then just to know prevalence you know we're talking you know one in five people has some kind of mental health condition one in five so if you're in a movie theater you're on a flight you're in a restaurant you're you know at a, whatever 
you know, you look around and you can see, you know, that it's very, very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so the research, the research tells us that it's when people do not, do not get the care that they need, that there's a whole range of cascading consequences. And you, you really touched on that, Kevin, in terms of homelessness. Homelessness is one of the consequences yes. of not getting the care that you need. And you see family erosion and um, people's health gets worse. Mm -hmm. People become homeless. People use use substances to feel better or they right, self-medicate right. and then all of a sudden they have an addictive disorder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's even, of course, that, then people end up getting involved in the justice system. One thing leads to another, then all of a sudden you're revolving in and out of a, of, of a, of a jail system. Right. And then you find yourself potentially, you know, in, in deeper, uh, more serious problems. And of course, suicide and victimization are also potential consequences. So mm -hmm. it's so important to look at mental health like any other medical problem. Well, what, what I find really, another aspect that I find important is the fact that here it is that a part of our judicial system, when I say our, I mean globally at this point, is becoming more aware of this and recognizing even that it is pretty much the gateway to a, 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 an unfortunate cycle of events. And My I gosh, say that because true. you mentioned it just now the first instance that an individual has in a, a mental episode connecting with the law potentially ends them up in jail and without the proper treatment now they after that first time the second time makes it easier for them to get back in jail it does and then it, it increases the the length of stay <laughs> or even the the degree of the charge it does you know i mean I, I you are spot on you have really done your homework i'm so i'm so proud of you I, you know thank you it is it is the revolving it is that revolving door you know when we started at the time that we started the court and the court you know is uh really was was the catalyst for the court was really a young man by the name of Aaron Wynn, right? Um, who uh, wasn't even met, didn't even have a mental illness initially. He had been involved in a very serious motorcycle accident, yes, and he had traumatic brain injury, and one thing led to another for him. And he got into a negative encounter with a police officer and he was arrested and his parents who lived in, in Broward County, they could never find any services back in the early nineties mm -hmm. for their son. He was getting ready to go to college. Right. And now here he is, um, you know, he's, he's in jail. He ends up getting committed to a forensic state hospital. And for your listeners, that means if somebody is deemed legally incompetent to proceed to trial, they go to a different kind of a jail. Mm -hmm. It's still a jail. Um, they, they call it a forensic hospital. There's not a whole lot of rehabilitation or treatment going on there. It's and just a Aaron hospital in name then. Literally held in 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 in, in um, solitary confinement yeah for, for about two years right two years yeah yeah so in four and five point restraints i mean it was it was tantamount to torture when he uh was finally released without notice to his family they couldn't take care of him properly right so and that then made the situation yeah. even worse 
so much worse. They 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 were pleading, you know, to 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 get help or get him into a hospital. That they couldn't get him into a hospital. There was a very long wait list, and sure enough, sure enough, as they you know their biggest fear came true. He was in a large one of our large grocery stores right here in Broward County, and he had a he had a an panic episode. attack or some kind of negative you know episode at the cashier as he was checking out as the story goes he darts out of the grocery store and then tragically collides with an 85 year old woman she falls to the pavement and then dies of her head injuries that were sustained and now aaron is mm -hmm. charged with murder but um even that charge though judge even that charge you know here it is that we we know how it happened we see here it is this young man running out of this place colliding not not intentionally <laughs> running into someone not intentionally pushing them down he collides with her and she dies as a result and it's not a case of involuntary manslaughter it's not a case of um, just an accidental death, murder. Well, he got very lucky. I mean, thank thank goodness, you know, for Howard Finkelstein, who yes. was our former public defender, who was appointed to represent him. You know, a charismatic, you know, uh, amazing advocate who. When he heard that story, just like you're telling it, but he heard it from his actual visiting his parents yes. one day to talk about, you know, the case, his mother, Aaron's mother, you know, sat Howard down and said, you know, you really need to hear from us and talked about the fact that, that they tried everything, everything mm -hmm. to get to get services and treatment for their son and and couldn't. And it was Howard then who wrote to a Broward grand jury um, asking for an investigation of Broward County's mental health system. Right. And sure enough, the grand jury took that case. And, and in 19, going back to 1994, issued a scathing 153-page grand jury report basically finding you know that that there were no services that mm -hmm. all you basically had was a couple of hospitals but there were no there were no you know community based services or case management services or you know day treatment programs or residential programs and and yes. nobody was accountable not to anybody for anything and and our system of care back then was de was labeled deplorable mm -hmm. it was deplorable and i think and and the, and the mental health court is a direct outgrowth of that grand jury report right right um our yeah our community decided you know we have to do something what are we going to do to help prevent people from getting trapped in the jail or like you said, Kevin, revolving like a revolving door endlessly yeah. with such suffering and such cost. How are we going to somehow jam that revolving door? And finally, Howard's vision, his vision was to create a specialized court. We had a drug court in Miami-Dade back then mm -hmm. using TJ as 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 the philosophy as the science uh, uh, behind the court process how could judges then become you know cheerleaders how could judges then step away from their you know traditional role of of being austere and and treating everybody the same and and adjudicating you know, guilt or innocence, but not looking to the root cause, mm -hmm. not looking to solve root cause behavioral health problems. Right. And it was TJ uh, that really emerged out of mental health law, out of human rights framework, 
um, that gave judges now the, 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 the empowerment to go into a court that is dedicated to problem solving, dedicated to, to well-being, and to be able to offer solutions. In drug court, it was to offer treatment over punishment. In mental right. health court, it's the same thing. Let's offer treatment over punishment. Okay, so that, that leads me to a, a question I have here. And but before I get into it, those who are, are tuning in by way of Facebook Live and, and Clubhouse, this is where we're going to part company. Please come on over to kevinstew.com, jump in the chat room, um, post your questions and comments. You can go ahead and, and give us a call also, 773-789-STEW. The lines are open, 773-789-7839. I'll tell you once more, 773 789 78 Three, nine. You can call, text, WhatsApp, Telegram, either work, but go ahead and, and please call us um, and, and be directly involved. Let's get involved. And, and KevinStew.com is where you are encouraged to have acceptance through enlightenment. So come on over. You don't need to, to register anything. You just go to the site and you're there. It is a secure site, those of you who are wondering. So don't panic. Nothing, no registration needed. No blood sacrifice, firstborn offering, or internal organ given up, nothing like that. You know, just come on over. Come just as you are. Those of you on Clubhouse, this is where we also part company. Everything is available and will be available on the podcast and the YouTube channel come tomorrow. And just go to kevinstew.com and you'll see the post with links to both plat to both um, platforms. And you can either listen or view it right there. All right. See you guys. Okay. So, Judge, how then you, you, you mentioned... Um, getting treated in in the right way um seeking proper treatment seeking a uh, proper course of action with individuals coming in with a mental health problem how does is there a way for one to move from criminal court because of an arrest to mental health court to treatment sure you know first of all there's there's hundreds of mental health courts around the country now and and uh you know everybody should know that so if you have a loved one with mental illness that ends up getting arrested and there's adult mental health courts and there's juvenile mental health courts okay and so it's very important to check with your local court systems um call the public defender's office they will know or check with your local mental health authorities, they will know. And, you know, because that's how you gain access um, to those courts. And, you know, the idea of, of why these courts become so important is they are interdisciplinary. They're led by, by clinicians. I mean, I'm very knowledgeable, but I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a judge. Right. So, you know, we have a, a clinician that, that therapeutically guides our court. And, you know, what, what the, the, the intersection of, of therapeutic jurisprudence in a courtroom is now we, now we could really humanize the law. Now we could take aim at stigma and discrimination and, and we could have you know, these dialogues in court between the person that we're working with and their families so that we could promote trust. We want to mm. promote trust. We want to be we want to be strength based. We want people to know that we or I am here to serve you. And these courts are voluntary. So, you know, it's very important for people to understand that these are services that you don't have to participate in, but um, the benefits are that we're going to lead your team. We're right. going to advocate for you. We're going to make sure that you get the quality care that you really need because the scarcity is, is so great. And then how we humanize the court process in terms of promoting you know, that type of 
of feelings that you're being heard, that you are being treated fairly, that we care about you, that we, you know, we only want the best for you. You know, that's really the beauty of the communication and the, and, and, and the way these courts function. Yeah. And, and that's, that's awesome. And <laughs> it's good to know that that ability exists because again, here you have individuals who they, they, they have, like you said earlier, most individuals are, are diagnosed in their teens, but it still t can take up to 10 years for anyone to actually put a finger on exactly what is going on. So you could be well into adulthood before an actual diagnosis is made. That's right. And That's by right. then something could happen or there was an initial diagnosis and, and, and maybe trial medication given or medication given on a trial and error basis because you know individuals vary you never really know how something is, is going to work for someone and that's right uh that's right you know we're still you know the sciences is the sciences and 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 engagement and the research tells us it's that engagement time you know those beginning mm -hmm. weeks uh that that you know are are challenging and and people do need a lot of they need a lot of information and they really need support, particularly, you know, in response, you know, to the pandemic. I mean, this pandemic yes. uh, in terms of mental health, Kevin, has been, you know, brutal. It has brutal. pushed many over the edge. You know, our suicide rates have, have really escalated. And I'm yes. so proud of our mental health court that back in 2015, you know, we, we took on suicide prevention, mm -hmm. you know, bringing it again out in the open, breaking taboos, changing narratives, you know, and we, and I declared the court, you know, a zero suicide initiative so that we could, I can give myself permission. I can give everyone permission. We can talk about suicide, right. you know, in the courtroom and educate um you know about suicide prevention where to get crisis services not to be afraid to ask people are you mm -hmm, thinking that mm -hmm. you're going to hurt yourself or harm yourself and to know what to do right and and what yes. what numbers to call you know we're moving this summer kevin nationally in the united states into a 988 national suicide prevention phone number no really? longer for mental health crises or suicide, you know, prevention crises types of calls. Are we going to be calling 911 anymore? That is exactly what we need because way too often we see the videos, we hear the stories, we read the articles about individuals having a loved one and they have an episode. And all they can call is 911. And when that officer is sent out, here it is, you're dispatched. All you get in dispatch for is a disturbance. You're coming on age as an officer. And everybody is in defense mode, self-preservation mode. And the moment that individual, just like Aaron Wynn, having an episode and running out of that store, can you imagine an officer and, and, and a lot of people don't see it from the officer's perspective. An officer wants to get back home to his family, even if he doesn't have a wife and, and children at home, it's still his family. He wants to get back home at the end of that day. And they, as individuals, they are going to want to defend themselves also. And here it is. If you can you imagine seeing someone charging at you, especially if it is someone who is a sizable figure that's right just charging at that's you that's right you know it's 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 been a very 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 serious and precarious dynamic and even though we have specialized you know that there's there's cit specialized law enforcement yes yes you know um 
teams called crisis intervention teams right. in policing that's become very, very popular. But again, you know, I feel that if I think that from a from a larger um, altitude, you know, my view, you know, has been that if we really want to move away from stigma and discrimination surrounding mental health, then we need to treat mental illness as illness, as health. Right. And if somebody's having a heart attack, they don't call a police officer. I mean, you know, um, you know, you an ambulance comes, paramedics come, trained clinicians would come. And so there's lots of, you know, states now and uh, cities and localities that are really looking, you know, to modify their crisis response with either co-responders uh, right. or really just just clinical response. Um, and uh, that's that's a real big trend going on now so that, um, that's what's... To, to move away, you know, to move away, you know, from this policing, this 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 total policing dynamic. Right. And really, really start looking at mental health response as health. So that's 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 the kind of response that we are going to get dialing nine eight that's eight what, you versus nine one one. It's a growing, it's a growing trend, um, and I think it's a it's a good one. It's a it's a healthy one. It's it's we want to prevent, you know, uh, the unexpected, you know, crisis responding to a crisis. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. It's happened here in South Florida way too often. Yes. And that's why, you know, you give family members special instructions. If you're going to call the police, you tell them, you know, do you have a CIT officer? My son, my daughter, you know, has a mental illness. I'm asking, I'm asking for a specially trained officer to respond Right. You know, and a lot of uh, the good news is a lot of agencies have that. Not all do, though. Right, right. And um, big ups to, to organizations like NAMI um, that have been integral in, 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 in integrating this kind of service in our law enforcement agencies across the United States. You know, they uh, have. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, yes. you know, has been the national leader um, in the CIT, you know, shifting to a crisis intervention type of uh, model so that we could prevent, you know, these types of, of tragedies. And um, that's they've been their integral, you know, really in all mental health um, innovations. And so, the, you know, I think that's really been a very, very popular model, right. you know, for so many years that that model just so people know, started in 1987 uh, out of Nashville and mm -hmm. um, Tennessee yes. because of a tragedy. Of course, you know, these tragedies um, often breed innovation. Uh, I say from desperation to innovation. Right, right. Uh, and that's certainly how the mental health court began as well. So going back to... to what I had asked if there's a way to transition out of criminal court into mental health court. Is there a process to that? And you mentioned the clinician being there, but is, is that clinician called in to the criminal court to determine whether this individual needs to go over to mental health court? How does that work? Well, it's in the same place. So if you're in my, so we're in my courtroom right now, correct? Right. And so if mental health court is in session, then you're in mental health court. And it, the, the way people get in is really just through a very simple open net referral process. You know, anybody can refer in, in Broward County, anybody can refer anybody into the mental health court. You don't need permission. You don't need records. You don't need... You know, other than a phone call, it could be case managers, parents, families, judges, anybody could make a referral into somebody and they will be seen in mental health court. So if immediately, if, if I have a, a history of mental illness 
I'm on medication. Um, stop taking my medication for whatever reason. Commit a crime. End up in in criminal court for this crime. It just it just takes one of my family members to say, hey, um, this is really a mental health court issue. It's a mental health issue. That's all it takes? Correct. Wow. So who do they tell? Yeah, correct. Who do, who, do they, who do they tell, though? They just call my office. Call my office, email my office. Um, you know, that's just anybody could contact my office through any means. And we put them on the very next docket. Why? Because we treat the court like a triage. I mean, the, the court is like a, a, you know, it's a healthcare triage. So we want to get to the sickest of the sick. Uh, as quickly as possible, because we understand that people aren't gaining access to care and that they may be like, if somebody has a heart attack, they need to go to a hospital. So we're really on the lookout for those individuals that may need that kind of acute care. Not that everybody does, but an estimated 30% do. Right. And then we could go and actually then start the process to get them to the right type of environment um, for treatment outside, you know, in the community and not in a jail system. So, and, and it's regardless of the crime that was committed? Well, in mental health, in, in misdemeanor mental health court, it's any, it's a great question, you know, it's any offense other than, and this is just the way our administrative order was drafted before mm -hmm. I got to the bench, uh, any offense other than DUIs, driving under the influence charges, but for, for county court, for misdemeanor court, any offense other than DUI and domestic violence cases, Battery cases need victim's consent, but other than that, any any charge could come in. Wow. And they just need to contact the 17th Judicial Court. Contact, yeah, that'll get to my office, make the referral. We get them right on a we, you know, everything's about everything's about being rapid. Rapid, you know, rapid um, referral process, rapid dockets. We want to get to see these people as soon as possible so that people can get the health care that they need, the mental health treatment that they need. An individual contacting your court with a situation like this, what is it just that they just need to give you the, the, um, the individual's name and the docket number? no other information medical history Correct. none of that is necessary just right giving... not to me but to my judicial assistant right right but right. uh and uh, you know my judicial assistant is just so incredibly fabulous but yeah just a name a name and a case number is always helpful when you're dealing with a court system wherever you are in the country yes or wherever you are name and a case number will you will will be anybody anywhere will be able to locate um you know that that matter and get it on a docket so that is that is how it is done here in broad county in the other counties and other states is that the same process do you know you know i would say i don't know you know every every, every jurisdiction is different but right. generally speaking if they have specialized dockets there is a referral system it's usually it's usually pretty basic um, and because the fidelities of, Ma of Broward's court, thank goodness, to a large extent have been adopted by the Department of Justice. And so yeah. those fidelities are pretty widespread. So, you, you know, it's, it should not be hard to access a treatment court. And, and, and that, too, you know, is, it's an awesome thing because having being the model on which the other courts are around the, around the country is built you know it, it's you need broad shoulders <laughs> to, to kind of hold that up and um kudos to you having been tossed in it 26 years ago um just <laughs> getting that call saying hey you know you're gonna be the first mental hey. health court judge Hey, you know, congratulations, congratulations, Ginger. You're our new mental health court judge. When do you want to start? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I was only on the bench about four months, but they knew right. 
they knew I was coming to the bench with some specialized skill sets in mental health and all of those different disciplines that cross mental health and, and public health and psychiatric rehabilitation and disability rights. Yes. So with, with, with what has been going on over the past two years and everything going virtual, is your court still virtual? It is. It is. I was, I wanted to go live. Um, I think it was sort of around toward the end of the summer. I really, you know, we lose something, Kevin, mm. you know, with on video, you know, yes. if we, you and I were sitting together in a courtroom, right? The, you could feel the, the energy. energy is different. Yes. You could feel, you know, the interaction. You really can't break through this video screen as much as we want to. Right, 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 right. right. And that's what we lose. You know, we lose that connection. And um, I was going to go live, and then that Omicron virus came. And so many of our people and families have other comorbid conditions. Yes. I didn't want to risk anybody's health. Got you. To bring them into the courthouse. Um, and it is very convenient, but it does that gap mm -hmm. of not mm -hmm. being together or me not being able to get off the bench and go sit down next to a, a parent a family member, maybe even share a copy, talk about what's, you know, these principles, give them information. I can't sit, I can't sit down like that. So what I did was I created a guide, a family resource guide now that's all linked up in Broward to all emergency mental health, uh, suicide prevention, uh, numbers, websites, crisis websites, NAMI Broward, family to family, you know, these gateway uh, resources. I'll get you a copy of it so you can share it, Kevin. Yes, please. Um, with your with your colleagues and, and, and whoever else. I've got I've got one edition for judges, one edition for lawyers, one edition for community, faith based um, mm. um you know um, Organ organizations, yeah. Yeah. And uh, just community providers, so they can they can feel comfortable, you know, sharing this. We could have one for the night shift edition, and yeah. um, in Broward. Yeah, and you know, I you know, just information is power. Information is power, and we could save lives. It's you know, just look, by look, getting look at, that out. Look at my shirt. Look at my shirt. My shirt what says, does it say? "From knowledge sprouts power." Yes, yes, it, exactly, and exactly. It, it's it's one of the hashtags that I use when I when I make my posts. Well, that's FKSP. it. It's true. That's exactly what it is. From knowledge sprouts power, and and yes. you know we miss out on, on on things like this, and you know for lack of knowledge we lose out, right? Yes. And yes. So, it's everything. It's it, everything. You have been quite busy since the last time we, we spoke, um, becoming a, 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 a professor um, also. So you, you sit on the bench and you're a lecturer also. Um, yeah, I do, I do a lot of public speaking, that's true. <laughs> yeah, you have been virtually and, and physically have been- And, I, and we're on Twitter, out. right? Yes. And um, so, Tell us a little bit about what some of the things that you've gotten involved with, especially with the lecturing and, and such. Sure. You know, well, I think that, you know, people really, really want to understand, first of all, about justice innovation. You know, how do you lead cultural change mm -hmm. um, in problem solving justice? And what does that look like? And how do you do that? And lots of communities are looking for these kinds of solutions. Why? Because there's resource gaps, there's policy gaps, and all of these psychosocial problems, they fall onto the steps of a courthouse, for example. Mm -hmm. And it, you're right, I was listening to you in the beginning, and it, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right, you know, that it should be the courts that are leading 
these efforts and yet this is where it is this is where you know these problems languish this is where they thrive in the juvenile system mm -hmm. because of trauma because of poverty because of adverse childhood experiences because of substance use because of all kinds all kinds of psychosocial problems that we have and uh you know that's that you, we're supposed to be problem solvers right right and the law is a helping profession so you know it's these types of topics that are very very popular and the idea of well how do you innovate how do you innovate courts and what does it look like and can we talk about that and so many just got back from charleston a couple of nights ago mm -hmm. um i've i've you know lectured you know all over um the world and the court has been honored at the hague and so i, I you know I've, I've helped scotland kind of jump start their adverse childhood experience movement there nice. their um their courts were very austere mm -hmm. and people didn't feel you know they weren't being offered help the judges there were not interested at the time, you know, in really in really humanizing the court process or or really focusing on trauma. Right. Because, like, for example, if you look at justice involved girls and justice involved women, for example, the data is overwhelming that almost 80 percent of girls and women that are justice involved have been victimized mm. um, and subject yes. to tr to extreme trauma, abuse. Um, and it's really important to be able to know that as a, as a judge so that we don't not only re-traumatize girls and women, but that we could offer gender responsive services, right? Yes, yes. Um, To them so they can recover, because you can recover um from trauma so uh it's it, you know we have to teach judges we don't learn this in law school we have to teach lawyers we don't necessarily learn this in law school i didn't learn this in law school i got trained on the job so mm -hmm. um this is the type of training and education you know that i love to do and and did i okay I thought I lost you there, Judge. You're still with me, right? Yes, I am. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you, your screen went glitchy just now. Um, so this this is what you have been traveling the country and the world, bringing in lectures. And so is this law school only that you've been going to? or No. <laughs> no, we go everywhere. Because, you know, um, community, it's, you know, just like in Broward. Yes. It, it only takes a small group of people, Kevin, to lead change, right? Yes. Um, you just need, like Margaret Mead said, a small group of concerned citizens, you know, to come together. And in that regard, you know, this, this ripple effect of change could be um, developed. And right, right. so in Broward County, it was a small group of, of advocates that came forward. And it's not, you know, and, and thank goodness we had, you know, a, a few judges and lawyers that really championed the cause. And mm -hmm. so I go out to community, you know, community forums, to law schools, to policy centers, to mental health organizations, to, to where, wherever they're interested uh, in learning and talking about mental health policy. And, right. you know, what we need to do uh in order to promote recovery and really enhance and expand access access to care and i i can see you doing that especially with how you describe your your in-person court sessions you leaving the bench going down to sit with a parent to have that one-on-one -on -one with them you know because Typically, and and we we talked about how your court sessions start, 
um, we talked about it on our first interaction. When you think court, you are you always think just like you are addressed, Your Honor. You know, you 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 go into court and there is the judge, and the judge has that gavel, and once that gavel hits, you know something is happening. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's for sure. And you're usually extremely nervous, right? And right. Scared. Right. But here it is. You are leaving your lofty bench and a lot of judges see themselves that way and their bench that way and you come down you know that's 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 one it it creates that connection with the community it does it does you know a couple of weeks ago i had a young man and he just wasn't doing well yes and I was in the courtroom and I, I just felt I really needed to come down. I, 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 I look at my deputy, I go, I'm coming down, <laughs> you yes. know, I'm coming, coming down. So, you know, and I'm sure and they, I, they know that the by now. And I go through another door and I go, I get back into the courtroom and I take a chair and I roll it up toward where he's handcuffed. You know, to the and he hand, people are handcuffed in our jury box, and I sit down a few, you know, a few feet away. Yes. And we have a conversation. I could then have a heart to heart conversation. It's on the record. Yes. I'm not doing anything inappropriate, but I felt like, wait a minute, we're just not connecting here, right? Right. right. I really need to see. I need to get. I need to get some connection going here. Um, so that's, if that's what I feel like intuitively, and a lot of this in Kevin is intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I trust my intuition. You trust your intuition. I know that. Yes. And, you know, I know that for a fact, and we just need to, we need to, to trust our intuition and do the things we need to do to what, whatever we can do to make that connection so that people know, wait a minute, this court is only here for one reason and mm -hmm. one reason only, and that is to serve you. Yeah, that, that, that I is... I mean, it's mind-blowing. Yeah, because typically, again, here it is, I go, again, you know, the, 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 the stigma around going to court, someone is in trouble. Someone has to defend their innocence because that is what going to court has. That's how we know it. That's how TV depicts it. That's how that's it's, right. it's depicted that's on right. the news. You know, that's right. This changing of the narrative. It changes everything. Is, is, it seems so far fetched, but yet at the same time, it's like the four agreements, you know, it's, it's everyday things that you're going through and using to change your life. I know it changed my life, but this is the simplest form of relating to each other in a community. You're not separating yourself. You're being a part of the community that you are in. And that's what the judicial system is there for. It's yeah, to be a part well, of the community. Well said, you know, well said. I just love what you just said. It's, it's so powerful. You know, we have community courts right. now. We've had community courts. The first one was in Brooklyn at Red Hook, uh, developed by the Center for Court Innovation. You know, going into those hot spots, yes, going in and creating uh, a space, maybe like a one shop, you know, one one shop stop where you can actually see a judge. You can get mental health services. You could get social services. That's that's what the Red Hook Justice Center is in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just think that we are a part of the community and we need to be uh, where we are, I think, in justice innovation. Not that not that serious offenders are going to come into mental health court. They're not. They're not. Mental health court and, and problem solving courts aren't for every candidate, aren't for everybody. Right, right. But but for those that can be served, you know, uh, they you know, the community is part of that court. The community 
is integrated within that court. And we can't function without the community and the community can't function without us. That, yes, that part right there. Um, you, it's one body. It's one. And it's one functional It's one body. collaborative, beautiful, beautiful, social justice collaborative model of, you know, we, we have a better way now. We have a better way of responding to these kinds of underlying problems so people won't recidivate, so mm -hmm. communities could be restored, so we don't have to waste all this money. We can put our money in education and healthcare and social services, uh, sending kids to college. Um, you know, that's what we, we, this is smart justice. Right. Uh, we need smart justice. Yeah, and and it's 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 that aspect of it that this, and I guess this is pretty much the newest branch of the judicial system, the, the mental health court. It's the newest. I think I think the way to put it is that problem solving courts yes and problem solving justice because that's what i teach right right um is the new wave it's the new wave mm -hmm. of of justice innovation and it's it's extremely transformative the elements are collaboration the elements are being interdisciplinary the elements are applying tj the elements are bringing, integrating the research into court process so we know what works. Yes. And <laughs> I, I, again, it's amazing. It's how the system has grown, this problem solving court. It's really exciting. Yeah. And, and to know that it, it, it started happening with drug court. Yeah, that's right. And to think and about the fact, Kevin, that if you have an idea, any yeah. big idea now, right, mm -hmm. that you want to solve, Kevin, and it's something that intersects in the legal system, you could you could innovate a court. People really? could innovate a vision of a court. And I tell that to my students. What is your passion? What is your passion? And, you know, we teach a change, a leading change theory. And if you know that, you know, you, we all have the ability now to be, to be innovators yes. of justice. That's, but is it just no, that we have this ability or this ability was always there? It's just that we weren't aware. It wasn't always there. It, okay. uh, it wasn't always there until, you know, problem solving courts really started to come online and more varietals uh, would join the drug courts and the mental health courts and the veterans courts. And now we have girls courts and community courts and gambling courts, rent eviction courts, homeless courts community courts i saw one there was some kind of lake there was like a lake courts and they there were problems uh environmental issues revolving you know this lake area and they held court in canoes i mean it was what? just amazing um their safe baby courts you know if you know if moms have addiction to opioids so that their their babies aren't taken away and you know, moving into a foster care system. Any problem now, bringing in experts, interdisciplinary teams through a collaborative approach, in a you know, we could create with the that, right kind of leadership. That just opens up doors, <laughs> all kinds of new doors and possibilities. It does. And it's it, amazing. It, it it takes the uh, the burden. It takes the burden off the criminal court system. It does because again, not I'm sure everyone's... my colleagues are very happy 
with me when I take cases <laughs> off their docket that they really aren't equipped to respond to. I know they're very happy with me. Well, and I'm very happy that they share their cases. You, with me. you, but you, you are a unique one in the system also because you also preside over um, criminal um, trials. I do. You, you sit that, in criminal court. That was a, you know, that that was a personal choice, and I just didn't want to get pigeonholed. Um, I was just looking at myself as a young lawyer coming on into a judgeship when I was like thirty uh, seven years old at the time, and I really wanted to get my judicial skill sets, and right. I wanted my judicial skill sets to be broad based, and I didn't want to be limited. So I said that was the one condition I told the chief judge at the time. I, I, I definitely, that was my biggest dream to come on the bench and apply all my specialized skills. But you, I have to, I have to also have a, do my regular division. That's awesome. And, and you playing the balancing act in, in and of itself, you know, that to tip my hat to you with that one. Because but when you think but, but when you think about it, then what you what happens is all of this great TJ work yes. goes right into the courts of general jurisdiction now. I could give the people in my regular tra traditional criminal division the same opportunity to take a therapeutic approach in their cases if they want mm. at any point. I could reframe an entire case for them um, from that TJ vantage point. And the lawyers know that. I make sure the lawyers know anytime you want, if you want to take a therapeutic approach in a tradition, in my regular general court of jurisdiction, you let me know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> this is judicial system redefined restructured reimagined yes that right that one reimagined so let's think growing the community let's think healing in the community let's, let's think, think healing yes community and I, I say this at the end of every broadcast. Remember your community is not just development, the development that you live in, but it spreads far and wide. So whether you walk, drive, ride, take the bus, the plane, the boat, the train, whichever way you traverse, the people you pass along the way are members of your community. And no, even a social media environment, your community has no borders. Not anymore. So think how much more, how much closer to a utopian society that we are getting when we change the narrative, when we change how we navigate the judicial system, when we recognize that individuals are going through traumatic experiences every day, not just the and, ones going and how out much, And how much prevention work we could do. Yes. And when we That's have, the goal, isn't it? Yeah. And when we have judges like you that come down from the bench and get up close and personal with an individual who is presenting their case, you know, that individual can only benefit from it, whether it is jail time or not. During the well, I don't I don't get off the bench in my regular division, but I you know because it is adverse. I mean you know the problem solving the mental health well, court is not it's, adverse. It's slightly different. But yeah. it, you know I have to you know there's certain rules of course of due process that have to be adhered to. So but 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 that's the beauty of alternative courts. That's the beauty that you could you could have you could have systems judicial legal systems that have all kinds of different varietals of courts um, and gives the public, gives our community, you know, uh, the opportunity to, you know, gain those kinds of benefits. Yes. All right, Judge, 
you is it is it time to go is it time to go <laughs> but believe it or not it is that time and and but you mind-blowing each time we, we we talk whether it's at an event as as we have at, at, at nami walks you know um are here are the little messages that we managed to squeeze in because your days are ridiculous <laughs> so, <laughs> you know court lectures I, I, I thank you. I really do thank you for taking the oh, time. Oh, thank you for having me back, Kevin. I'm every time I'm with you, you know, I, I I'm lighter. I'm I'm lighter. <laughs> I'm 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 healed. I'm, you know, I'm reinvigorated. Thank you, you are just a shining, shining light. You're a shining star. I adore you, and I just. Every time, you know, we don't get to see each other very often, but when I do, I'm yeah. so thrilled and honored. Speaking of which, so prior to going virtual, you 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 invited individuals to come into your court. Is there a way to virtually do that? Oh yeah, of course. How how do yeah, we? Yeah, anybody's how... welcome in a virtual court. You know, it's 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 as long as it's not a confidential hearing that I don't I don't have those, but some judges do. Right, right. So yeah, you could you could you know you could just you know, I'll give you a Zoom link and you're always welcome to come into Zoom court and check out both and uh, any division. How, how does one request that link? Just uh, I'll just say, I'll just, well, it's on our 17th judicial website. Okay. What's, um, a, what's the site? Every, every judge's link is by their county judicial division. So you just navigate the website. It's a very navigable uh, website. Okay. For the seventeenth judicial circuit. So it's it's what what is the, the the URL for it? Oh, I don't know. I don't have it memorized. Okay, so once we but search, but it's www seventeenth judicial circuit <laughs> Okay, so just pretty much just just search um, whatever yeah. search engine we use. Just use that yeah. and look for 17th the seventeenth judicial, judicial circuit, circuit and my name. <laughs> okay, so yeah, all right, you'll cool. find it. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Because <laughs> um, no, nobody has to really schedule out a time to make their way physically down there. So it has its that's goods right. and it's it's, it's the, not that so That is the great. beauty of technology. Yeah, yeah, it, it comes yeah. in handy every now and then. And and those who are tuned in from clear across the pond, the the UK listeners have an opportunity to get a better idea of what is happening here in Broad County. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, and and what is coming to if it's not already there because you know it's expanding out in in other aspect in other parts of the world. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a global model and it's not everywhere, but it's in a lot of countries and in the UK. Yes. And that's exciting. Yeah. So, you know, people <laughs> check her out. Her name is Judge Ginger Lerner Wren. There's her name at the bottom of the screen right there. Um easy to find and the ren is w r e n um so she's easy to find just just 17th judicial circuit um, yeah 17th judicial circuit court look her up search for her online and check out, check out the zoom link <laughs> you know when court is in session um visit i'm going to be visiting court <laughs> that would be great we'd love to we'd love to have you Kev. oh yes uh, so judge thank you again for taking the time you're also. welcome good night thank you so much for night. having me my pleasure and um i i, I guess uh, court is now closed <laughs> yes court is adjourned <laughs> no all rise <laughs> good night see you soon good night we'll talk soon take Bye. care <laughs> ladies and gentlemen judge ginger learner wren what an awesome, awesome person she is. What a, a beautiful spirit, what a beautiful soul. Does it get any better than this? Can it get any better than this? Well, the only way to find out is to stick around and wait and see. You know, it's 26 years and going and growing. Let's, let's do our part 
to live in a better community. We're going to take a quick little break. When we come back, we'll jump into musical therapy. We'll be right back. Today in school, I learned a lot. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes me. In English, I learned that I'm disgusting. And in physics, I learned that I'm a loser. Today in school, in math, I learned that I'm ugly and I useless. And in gym, in biology, I learned that I'm pathetic that I'm fat, and a joke. In history, I learned that I'm trapped. Today in school, I learned that I have no friends. In English, I learned that I make people sick. And at lunch, I learned that I sit on my own because I smell. In chemistry, I learned that no one In biology, I learned that I'm fat and stupid. And in math, I learned that I'm trash. The only thing I didn't learn in school today... The only thing I didn't learn today... The only thing I didn't learn... Is why no one ever helps. Kids witness bullying every day. They want to help, but they don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at StopBullying.gov. A message from the Ad Council. Imagine having our own Caribbean center. Imagine a museum highlighting our history and the contributions of Caribbean people to the world. Imagine being able to visit and learn about the islands we call home in a place where our kids can see and feel their cultural heritage. You can make this vision come to life. Help us create this first of its kind space that all Caribbean people can be proud of. Your contribution to Island Space Caribbean Museum will help this dream come true. Visit islandspacefl.org slash GoFundMe. Visit islandspacefl.org slash GoFundMe. Visit islandspacefl.org slash GoFundMe and donate today. Media Group, innovative streaming and recording has done it again. A new way to get your business in full view of your neighborhood consumer through AdShare TV. It's available in your neighborhood today. It's easy. Just call us 754-999-6020. Become a host today and place a TV monitor in a strategic location so it's easy to see. Get a one minute video ad or longer that plays anywhere in our network. Can't be a host? No problem. For a few dollars, we'll run your 30 second video ad. A host can run announcement specials like buy one get one free or discount ads. Let's turn your flyers into a 30 second video with music or a voiceover or let us create and run your video ad with a spokesperson. Take advantage of our early enrollment discount. Join us today. Your ad will be seen at least 30 times per day in your AdShare TV neighborhood. It's easy. Just call us 754-999-6020. Add Sheer TV, part of Pulsing Media Group. Great music is one thing, sharing it with the world, that's another. Let the professionals at Reggae Global Entertainment help you to another level. Specializing in artist management, booking, public relations and marketing, and promotion. Reggae Global Entertainment can help you with event planning, websites, photography, and video production, press releases, legal services, and graphic design. They can even help you with music production so you can get the sound that you want every time. Call Reggae Global Entertainment at 954-804-8199. That's 804-8199. Or visit them online at reggaeglobalentertainment.com. Yes, yes, yes. Akar Mantino, I'm making notes right now. You are locked in to DJ Kevin Stew on the night shift. It's easier to love than it is to hate. It's time to put the case to rest It's easy It's not But people have had enough That's why That's why I say We got to try love We got to try love 
got to try love The zone of Pat Satchmo working out of the stamina all stars And see must keep them closer But they drain your energy yeah. Is that what he got off this musical therapy segment? We try to get along Courtesy of Magnum Trucking To find some common ground Cause love is easy is rough for people have had enough that's why on a martyr dread I say love, positive people. it's called positive people
Good sailor, positive people attract other positive people. So don't you, don't you dwell on the negative. I say, within positive people attract other. This is the sound of Red Fox. Red Fox. Red Fox. Track called I'm a Lion. through musical therapy. This is on a Kirk Davis. You know him as little Kirk.
track is called You Are The Reason, the sound of Lil Kirk. This is Yishka from the self-titled album. Be grateful for the track is called Be Grateful For Life. Thanks for each day that you're here. I know sometimes it's rough, still you gotta face the day. So be strong. The time is now, so you, you gotta do your best. Hey, and stand tall. Greet each day, hey, in your own way. Hey, never give. it in your mind don't let go no 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 surround yourself with people who will help you on your time you gotta stay strong you know Son of Zapology. It's called Overcome. Been the fire, been through the rain, been through the madness and been through the pain. But through it all, she would find a way to make things better. So in mind over matter, didn't have a clue to walk through this madness. Patience she knew, but through it all, she would find a way to make things better. She sing, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, yeah. Apology. Z a p o l o g y. Zapology. New music from him. It's called Overcome. This is 
Blue Zone of Ed Robinson. Track called Love is the Light. Closes us out with a track called Love is the Light. When, when the I want to thank McNeil Trucking once again for sponsoring Musical Therapy. With McNeil Trucking, you're in good hands. Give him a call 954 406 9740. And thank you to my segment, to my affiliates. You feel it. One Harmony Radio, NIE Radio, Island Worldwide, PEMGTV.com, Oliwap Radio, Dusik Media Group, WGLRO. Like I appreciate love each and every one of you guys. Oh, yeah. love Remember, yeah. look out for members of your community. And your community is not just the development that you live in, but it spreads far and wide. So those you pass on the bus, the plane, the boat, or the train, whether you walk, ride, or drive, these are members of your community. Look out for one of them and do something good for one of them today because you never know who's going to do something good for you tomorrow. Take care until we do it all over again tomorrow. Healthy love. Same time, same place, right here, KevinStew.com. Blessings to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world from right here in South Florida. Good night.
Greetings and salutations, one and all. You're invited to tune in to the night shift with DJ Kevin Stew. It airs on Mondays with community and finance, Tuesdays with healthy love, and Wednesdays with real talk from 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Come spend some time interacting in the stew pot where we keep things bubbling and wind down in musical therapy. The night shift with DJ Kevin Stew is on kevinstew.com where you're encouraged to have acceptance through enlightenment.